Sunshine Cathedral is a different kind of church where the past is past and the future has infinite possibilities. This is the day our God has made. And bless is God's kingdom now. Ernest Holmes has written, My life is in thee, O inner presence. I look upon thee, and hope springs forth into realization. O hope within me, undying evidence of good, thou dost completely hold me in thy loving embrace, and from this fond caress, assurance shall be born, and confidence and love. In these human words, God's voice is heard. We read in the book of Lamentations, the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. Divine mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in God. God is good to the seeking soul. It is good that one should wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. In these human words, God's voice is heard. Thanks be to God.
sun keeps me Would you please join me in prayer? Let us dwell together in peace. And let us not be instruments of our own or others' oppression. And now, may God's word be spoken. May only God's word be heard. Amen. Amen. Well, our scripture reading today comes from Lamentations, that sort of Odd, isn't it, to have a a scripture text called Lamentations? But we know what lamenting is. We know what a lament is. We know what lamentations are. It's an expression of grief, a passionate expression of sorrow. And that pretty fairly sums up the book of Lamentations. Only five small chapters, but all of them just aching with grief over a profound loss. Each chapter of Lamentation is a funeral dirge, a funeral hymn, a dirge, responding to the fall of Jerusalem and the exile that followed. The city has been overrun. The city has been taken. The city is not what it was. The city is no longer ours. The city and all that it stood for seems to be lost, at least for a while. And the writer of Lamentations is heartbroken and doesn't know what to do with that pain other than to express it. The book of Lamentations declares this devastating sorrow after the fall of Jerusalem. But the sorrow isn't just that the, the gover- we've lost control of the government. It isn't just that we've lost control of, of the real estate or that we've lost control of the culture or that just things have changed or that we don't have the influence we once had. That's not what the writer is sad about. The writer is sad about the loss of a vision. The writer is sad about the loss of values. The writer is sad about the loss of a dream where peace would reign and abundance would bless every life, and compassion and justice would rule hearts and homeland. The writer is sad for the loss of a dream where generosity would outlast animosity, and where every wayfarer could be seen as a new potential friend. What happened to the city that could have been? What happened to the city that we thought God wanted us to have and the city that God wanted us to be? And how will we ever reclaim the vision? How will we ever reclaim the hope of what might be? I'm just talking about Jerusalem back in the day. I'm just talking about Jerusalem right now, right? I'm talking about lamentations. If it sounded familiar to anything else, I don't know what that's about. I'm talking about Jerusalem and the book of Lamentations. The truth is, Sometimes loss is so overwhelming. Disappointment is so heartbreaking. Situations are so monumentally unfair. We can't possibly move through the ache until we express it. Sometimes something is just so terrible. We can't even imagine brighter days until we deal with the pain at hand. Sometimes we need to swear. That's my, go, that, that's my go-to coping mechanism. And sometimes we need to punch a pillow. Now, unless your significant other's nickname is pillow, don't do that, but. Or sometimes we just need to break down with an ugly cry. You ever had an ugly cry? And then we can say, God, help me get myself back together. Help me focus more on what is left than on what is lost. Help me see what I can do to rebuild. Help me see how things can get better. When I was a kid growing up, like Robinson Crusoe, you know, had my kind of existence. The dirt road, four parties on a party line. We had our own well, which we treated with Clorox bleach, my hand to God. We had three television channels and a snow channel. So we had four channels, but three with programming and then one with whatever that was. 
So this was my life, right, in, in rural Arkansas growing up. Well, in, out in the country, there was also this one mansion. I don't know why this mansion was there. It was a gray brick mansion, and it was really out of place. <laughs> but there was this gray brick mansion, and it burned down, just burned down one day. And so that was that, right? I guess they're going to move or rebuild, you know, buy a new house or build a new house or something. What are they going to do? What they did, though, was because they so loved, they must have built it from scratch. There must have been some sentimental value because what they wanted to do is take what they had left and do something with that. And so after the house had burned down, this huge mansion had burned down, they took all the bricks that could be salvaged and they built from those. Now, what was built wasn't the same old mansion. It was different. In fact, it was a much smaller house, just one story, but it was beautiful. And it was a tribute to, if you focus on what's left, you still have something amazing. And so they rebuilt their house with what was left. We can be positive and optimistic and ready for a miracle once we've let ourselves acknowledge that our pain is real and our sorrow is profound. We can take what is left and rebuild once we have grieved the loss of what has been lost. And that's what we see in Lamentations. Five chapters of moaning and wailing and why God, why? And even though this is five chapters of why, why? There are still little glimmers of hope because if you take even your pain to God, if you take even your frustration, if you take being overwhelmed, if you take your rage, whatever you take to God, God's going to make better. So five chapters of why, God, why, and still in that prayerful exchange, we get God's mercies are new every morning. Why, God, why? I will hope in God. And so if we will bring our pain into our faith life, if we bring our pain into our spirituality, if we bring our pain into our prayers, God will not leave us there. And so here is this person crying out, why God, why? But also knowing in the midst of that, I will hope. If I don't hope today, I'll hope someday. I will hope. Hope will return. I may be running low on hope today, but I'll get it back because faith is a long game. Don't judge your spirituality. Don't judge your future. Don't judge your character. Don't judge anything by what is happening today. It's a long game. Today could just be a bad day. It could be a bad year, but it's a long game. And so I will hope in God again. There are seasons of ease and seasons of challenge. There are times when we are confident and times when we are burdened with doubt. There are times of optimism and there are times when we are almost hopeless. And then there are times that we need to confess that we are being generous by saying almost hopeless. But we will reclaim our hope. We will renew our strength. We will get our second wind. Deliverance is on the way. I promise it is. I can't tell you how and I can't tell you when, but it will show up. Even in the most troubling times, we can affirm that the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. In the book of Daniel, it's a famous children's story at this point, but in the book of Daniel, there is a king, Nebuchadnezzar, he probably really, uh, the story is probably really about Antiochus IV Epiphanes, a very brutal ruler that, that came after. But nevertheless, in the story, King Nebuchadnezzar has decided that he wants to build this huge, beautiful, expensive, garish idol, this golden thing. And it's very expensive, it's very mighty, and, and, and it's very impressive. And so he has built it, and it's so amazing, he wants all of his subjects to worship it. They can worship other gods, he doesn't care, as long as they worship this one, this monument to his power and privilege and wealth. But there are three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who were faithful to their own spiritual path and to their values, and they would not worship an idol of wealth and power. They would not worship the idol of wealth and power. I'm talking about the book of Daniel right now. That's all I'm talking about. <laughs> and that huge gold statue representing the king's power and privilege and wealth must have been impressive, but these young men had different values, kindness, 
and courage and hope and peace and generosity and hospitality. That's what they valued. Their God represented peace and plenty, hope and healing for all people and not just a privileged few. They did not worship the king's power or his wealth. They did not bow to his idol and so they were sentenced to death. They were thrown into an oven. But the story says they survived, and what's more, witnesses say they saw a fourth figure in the fire. We saw three go in, but then when we were looking in, we saw a fourth figure. Now, the writer probably meant to suggest that there was a protective angel with them, but in ancient literature, angels represent God's presence. Remember when Moses is having an encounter with a burning bush? Sometimes it says the Lord says, and sometimes it says the angel of the Lord says. It's interchangeable. The angel of God's presence represents God's presence. So when he's telling us that there is a fourth person, a fourth entity, a fourth, a fourth figure in there, an angel is in there, what he's telling us is God's in the fire. Sometimes we feel like the world is on fire, but God is in the fire because there's not a spot where God is not. When the world is topsy-turvy, when chaos is everywhere, when what we thought we could count on seems lost, when peace is in peril, when dignity is in danger, when compassion is crowded by cruelty, when justice for all is perverted to all for just us. That's when we are called to renew our hope. That is when we are called to encourage one another. That is when we are called to sing and pray, Rodney. That is when we are called to resist and rise up. When a woman in the Gospel of John was about to be stoned by those who used religion like a weapon against people they didn't like, oh, praise God, that day is over. <laughs> and they were using religion to justify stoning this woman. They didn't like what she had done with her body, and they were going to punish her by now controlling her body, by bruising her body, by hurting her body, maybe by even killing her body. When they were going to attack her body, Jesus put his body between them and her body. When her body was being dominated and controlled and attacked, Jesus stood up, and he stepped up, and he said, if you've never needed understanding... If you've never needed compassion or a second chance, if you've never screwed up, if you've never made a choice you later regretted, if you ever did something you weren't sure you were, you were proud of, then you throw the first stone. And he saved her life, but he also risked his own, really. He was outnumbered, they had rocks, he had just integrity and hope and decency, but he stood up. And he spoke up and doesn't following Jesus demand that we take the same risks even still. When voting rights are attacked, when the free press is attacked as recently as last week with literal bullets, when Muslims are targeted, when same gender loving people are dehumanized and demonized, when Puerto Ricans are left in the dark for months on end, when people fight tooth and nail for fetuses but won't lift a finger to protect brown and black children from being shot, tased, caged, or ripped from their mother's arms. In such times, it is time for Jesus' people to stand up, to speak up, and to act up. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they fought injustice. Now, they didn't use deadly weapons. That's, that's not how we fight. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Is that right? We don't use hate, and we don't use venom, and we don't use mean rhetoric, and we certainly don't use violence. But Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they sh showed us in the story how to fight injustice. They didn't use weapons. They used integrity. They used hope. They used courage. They used resilience. That was their weaponry. They fought without hate, and they fought without violence. 
And they defeated greed. And they defeated weaponized religion. And they defeated authoritarianism by simply not yielding to it. And they prevailed. And we, as people of faith, can follow their faithful example as one famous fraternity has as a motto, we can adopt as our own, we will fight until hell freezes over and then we'll fight on the ice. <laughs> Nonviolently. Nonviolently, we just won't give in to the temptation to hate, and we just won't give in to the temptation to hide, and we just won't give in to the temptation to turn a, a blind eye to what is going on. We will stand up, and we may experience some fire for it. I am not saying there's no fire. I'm not saying we won't be marched into some very difficult and uncomfortable situations, but what I'm saying is that if we will face it, God is in the fire. Will we dare to stand up and speak up, knowing that no matter what happens, God is with us even in the fire. I can't promise that we will have no reason to lament. In fact, sometimes we have to lament. But I can promise that no matter what we face, we face it with God. And God can help. God's help may come in the form of our generosity. It may come in the form of our resilience, our support of good causes, our encouragement of one another, our determination to resist injustice, but God's help is at hand because there's not a spot where God is not. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. Divine mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. God will help us rise up for justice love. God will help us speak up for the marginalized, the downtrodden, the victimized, the hurting and helpless. God will help us feed the flock. God will help us work for peace. God will help us bind up the brokenhearted. God will help us deliver good news to the poor. God will help us ask for release of political prisoners and asylum seekers. God will help us welcome the stranger. God will help us affirm the sacred value of all people. Once upon a time, people stood up to tyranny by dumping their tea in Boston Harbor, by declaring independence, by affirming that there were unalienable rights that everyone was entitled to. Maybe it's time on the week of Independence Day that we speak up again for unalienable rights, that we declare independence for all people, that we once again take risk to affirm the sacred value of all people. God will help us stand up and speak up and when necessary, act up. God can help us proclaim, embody, and live out the gospel of God's all-inclusive and unconditional and everlasting love. God can help. And with God's help, we will make a difference. And this is the good news. Amen. Amen.